So once this adjustment, that psychological um, change, that switch taken place, that as awareness, which is who you are, you are not just the body, takes place, it is often accompanied by this disturbance in sleep pattern. But I reassure you, this will all go back to, as it were, how it was, but without you losing the awareness any longer. So this is the first and most important adjustment at that level that is required, that you never slept and you never will sleep in your life. As awareness, you are always awake. Bodily activity, mental activity, that's something else. Okay? Question entitled Struggling with Insomnia Despite Ayurvedic Approaches. I will read short background. I have been following Igor's work for one and a half years now. I have been to the Vienna Emergence since March 2023. Since February of this year, I have been struggling with insomnia and panic attacks. On average, I don't sleep for two days every week, which has turned my life into a real hell, especially since I have two and a half year old daughter and this issue affects my family as well. I know my constitution is Vata, and even though I have tried all kinds of herbs and methods, I also had an Ayurvedic guidance with Amrita Ma Devi, Igor's wife, the insomnia continues. It feels like there is almost no room for error regarding food and lifestyle, even though I have already been living like a yogi for the last couple of years. There have been many times this year when I thought about going to a psychiatrist to get myself sleeping pills, but up until now I was able to avoid this. I will still keep trying to use Ayurvedic herbs, but I have a question regarding meditation. Questions. I know many Vata people have problems in this type of spiritual work, and I know I'm not the only one, but how are such problems resolved? Do the problems go away once the heart is opened? And how much shall I meditate? I reduce my meditations from twice daily one hour per day to once per day because I'm not sure whether the medita meditation is making my vata go out of balance or not. I'm starting to lose hope as all the lifestyle changes don't seem to help. All right, so we'll speak to this now. And um, as we acknowledge the fact that indeed the issue of not being able to fall asleep easily, let alone the acute cases of insomnia, are very common when it comes to the awakening of life force, or even in some cases, activation of prana. And of course, those of us, uh, just as the questioner understands very well already himself, those of us who are mainly fall under the category of having that vata constitution, or not necessarily vata in prakriti, it can be there is a combination where one way or another vata is more likely to go out of balance they are more prone to this kind of uh, disturbances and this kind of issues associated with getting a sound sleep. But before we go into the therapeutic application, I'd like to speak to this from the psychological perspective because it's equally, if not, more important. So, what do I mean by psychological implications? I mean by that that we understand sleep to be natural functioning of the body. It's something that belongs to the very way how the nervous system functions due to the alternating 
uh, waves uh, dominant in, uh, let's say, uh, or spoken of as brainwave activity, which is associated with the functioning of relative states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. And they alternate, they change, because all of them are this circling, rotating frequencies of one and only transcendental. And transcendental, of course, then can be broken into the greater degree uh, of subtlety, right, from the classically spoken Turya and Turya Tita. Uh, we can speak to that as the transcendental cosmic God and unity consciousness. But we're just speaking about this in terms of sleep in a sense of how we understand this to be in terms of our, uh, let's say, life per se, like we somewhere it is stated statistically that we sleep that many years out of our lives. It's like a, a vast number of years that we spend in sleep. So therefore, of course, sleep is extremely important. So this is just goes without saying that the value of sleep here cannot be overestimated. However, there is no enough clarity in terms of what is happening when we sleep to our consciousness, or if anything happening to our consciousness. And this is where I would like to make this slight adjustment so as to then move to the more applicational therapeutic um, aspects to further tweak that what this particular questioner is dealing with. So, waking, dreaming, deep sleep are basically could be narrowed down in terms of waking is characterized by the functioning of organs of cognition that provide the possibility for sense perception to take place and activity of the mind for whose sake in this case all this perceptual capacity is is orchestrated in the first place so this conjunction this uh, simultaneity of all perception that for which the body is equipped with the senses and the mind here that interprets these experiences is what characterizes waking state of consciousness and uh, at some point of course the body gets um, the rather nervous system and the mind gets saturated with the experiences and the processing power of the mind begins to get uh, down. So some change of activity is required. And that, that change of activity here is switched to another opus, um, oper um, uh, modus operandi known as sleeping or dreaming state, where senses gradually begin to withdraw from respective organs of cognition and, as it were, rest in the domain of the mind only. So mind then in the dreaming state abides in its own without any input that is otherwise provided by the senses. After some time, which also gives the possibility for the mind to get access to the subconscious material, the subconscious level of experiences, which otherwise is not accessible in the conscious state, the modus operandi also exhausts itself and a deeper rest is required. So in other words, mind needs to switch off. And that's when deep sleep ensues. And deep sleep in duration is always shorter. We could say approximately for, if we look at the clock, for one quarter of a deep sleep there are three quarters of sleep with dreams. But that shorter duration of deep sleep is adequate enough and sufficient enough for the full 
rest of the entire nervous system. This is important as it will become clearer in a moment. So, in other words, deep sleep here is where we're really getting a full rest from all activities. For that reason, deep sleep is also, as you know, and have heard us uh, periodically bringing that as a reminder, is equivalent and very close, we speak of it as a cousin of samadhi. Because the situation is provided when it's complete rest from all activities. So therefore, deep sleep here is what we refer to often as uh, poor man's meditation. In the sense that people who don't meditate, the deep sleep here takes care of that. Of course, that's not enough, but that's at least how Mother Nature has designed us so the system doesn't completely overheat and get busted. So, with this understanding, the main understanding here is that our consciousness doesn't slip for a split of a moment. All this activity takes place in nowhere but in our awareness, in our consciousness. Our consciousness strings all these three relative states and that stringing, as it were, literally as the beads of the mala on that invisible thread that penetrates the states and that's what keeps them together. On, its, on their own, they don't have a stand. So therefore, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, they come and go, they come and go. What remains is that uninterrupted consciousness or uninterrupted awareness, we're using this interchangeably now, these terms. Therefore, uh, there is this, at some point, I felt compelled to uh, write a very short article entitled Brahman Never Sleeps. In other words, absolute or awareness never sleeps. And it was dedicated precisely to this very aspect, psychological readjustment in terms of what's happening when we undergo these, at times, very disheartening phases during awakening, because that's what's happening during awakening, our sleep pattern is often overthrown, disturbed, because some work carries on in that time or during that time when it usually was associated with us just being knocked out, uh, being knocked either into subconscious or unconscious state of deep sleep, and we simply had no awareness whatsoever of how we fall asleep, how we sleep per se, and equating all this with the same blanket of insomnia is a gross misunderstanding. I'm speaking um, about this with many years of experience of working with those, including, paradoxically enough, meditation teachers who have suffered from this kind of form of psychological misunderstanding on the nature of sleep, and some of whom resorted indeed to substances to help them to be knocked off and shut down, and then, of course, realizing that this is not what really this is whole thing is about, would bring the phase of rehabilitation when one would have to go off these medications, get off these um, sleep-inducing substances, all of which, without exception, have side effects. So this is great that you have not yet resorted, the questioner, uh, have not yet resorted to any sleeping pills. You don't want to go down that road. So therefore we speak to this first and foremost to bring that psychological clarity that our awareness does not sleep for a moment. I'm not going to go into the um, examples of uh, some extreme tantric sadhanas, which, uh, for example, uh, have this methodology of consciously depriving one from falling asleep and giving oneself to that possibility of fostering uninterrupted awareness. Uh, the 
prime example of that would be um, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who went through that whole sadhana, which was known as a sadhana of no sleep. Uh, some of the spiritual practices in the Surat Shabd Yoga, for example, utilizes this nighttime meditations. When meditators are advised to remain awake as much as they possibly could, we're not going there. Our methodologies are much more uh, attuned and derived from spontaneous, natural way of how pranas realign themselves. So therefore, I thought to mention this as a possibility in terms of practices so that you have also have that uh, additional understanding that if and when we do something consciously with awareness, then it almost as if defies the logic, defies the uh, rule of what otherwise safeguards everything. There is, of course, this kind of methodology, uh, the aforementioned one, of depriving oneself of sleep consciously is not applicable to your life because your household, your married man, you have a child, and this would be not conducive at all for your lifestyle because you need to be sharp during your waking states. I mean, during your waking hours. This is clear. You don't have that luxury of perhaps being in that reduced state of acuity of perception throughout the day, as often uh, results after sleepless nights spent in meditation. So therefore, going back to this important adjustment, that when you go to sleep, when you already have been experiencing this disturbance, and that what already being spoken by you, addressed by us, insomnia. Instead of having this sense of something terribly wrong is happening to me, I'm being deprived of sleep, I got used to be knocked out and sleep and come, come out of sleep, wake up and feel like, oh, yes, I slept very well. Instead, try this. You go to sleep, whilst being fully conscious of the fact that your consciousness is not falling asleep, never fell asleep, never sleep a blink of an eye. You always remain awake. Always. In fact, even the word always here is irrelevant. You are simply awake. Your nature, your essence is being awake. And there are some changes are undergoing in the phases of which correspond to dreaming and deep sleep states. So there is a, some heightened pranic activity in your nervous system where some rewiring taking place even whilst you are, as it were, in bed, asleep, and feel as if you're not sleeping. The whole difference here is what also very well known in the practices which have the name lucid dreaming. People who practice lucid dreaming, they have a methodology of how to enter the state where when one, when one is supposed to fall asleep, one remains awake and as that witness that hovers above, as it were, allegorically or maybe directly speaking, above the body, whilst the body is at rest. So once you introduce this very important adjustment, the, that tension that is created in your mind will give in to that, well, there's nothing wrong, this is a process, I'm giving myself to it completely, I'm remaining awake as awareness, I am always awake. Okay, so let these processes take over. So this is psychological adjustment to the understanding of what is taking place right now when there is a flip potentially happening. Extraordinary important shift where your awareness, which prior to this moment has been chiefly associated with the body-mind 
conglomerate and nothing else. So therefore, all activities of your body is what was instructing you about yourself. You did not speak or imagine of yourself as other than being the body with all its functioning. But now the time has come for that very important adjustment, radical change, where the awareness, as it were, dislodges from that association. And that association is, of course, checked. You see? It's checked, it's reinforced by the rotating frequencies of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep as they come and go. And when your body goes into that state of complete slumber and you lose your awareness, as if you lose your awareness, because awareness is never lost. It is this temporal experience which feels as if awareness is lost because it breaks down from one phase which is influenced by certain brain activity, certain waves, certain activity that is predominant at a given moment in time. And when it switches to another, there is this, it feels as a breakdown. So it feels as if awareness is broken down. So when we wake up from a deep sleep, if it was a very deep sleep and if there was no transgression from waking up from deep sleep through going back to dreaming state and then to the waking state, often it feels so abrupt and so sudden that it takes few moments to adjust, to adjust what date it is, what time, it, what, what, you know, where am I? Like it may take fraction of time, but there is this coming from a void of deep sleep into the waking state, which by the way, tantrically speaking, is much more preferable than waking up from just deep sleep, going back to the dreaming state, and then waking up. Because in that case, you see, we take less of that poor man's samadhi into the waking state. When we wake up from deep sleep straight into the waking state, we bring that full awareness of rest into the midst of activity. It's very like meditation. Uh, I will give another example. It's very, very acutely experienced when we have this sudden nap uh, during the day, when we're like really tired, when the body just takes over, nothing I can do about it. You just lay down, you switch off, and it may be just 20 minutes. And you wake up from that nap, which was like falling into that gap of a deep sleep, and you feel completely refreshed. And there is this sense of novelty and, and spark. So this is what I'm talking about. So once this adjustment, that psychological um, change, that switch taken place, that as awareness, which is who you are, you are not just the body, takes place. It is often accompanied by this disturbance in sleep pattern. But I reassure you, this will all go back to, as it were, how it was, but without you losing the awareness any longer. So this is the first and most important adjustment at that level that is required, that you never slept and you never will sleep in your life. As awareness, you are always awake. Bodily activity, mental activity, that's something else. Okay? So, now moving to more specific, uh, let's say, uh, applicational therapeutic um, way of speaking about it. Uh, you had a session with my wife, Amrita Madevi, and I will recommend you to follow up with that because, uh, forgive me, I don't believe that you are um, exhausting all the possibilities of these holistic applications and s saying that you've been living for the last two years uh, as a yogi, all this. And somehow, forgive me, this just sounds so improbable with two and a half year old child being married man in the center of Europe. This is so, so unlikely. 
you have a job, you have activities. Um, what is your screen time? Do you work on your computer, on your phone at night before going to sleep? If the likelihood is there, which is not mentioned in your inquiry, then already you're jittering your system, particularly the vata, to such degree that it's very, very difficult for it to settle down. And this settling down is very important. So prior to going to sleep, there has to be this time of complete and utter non-activity when it comes to mental exertion, when it comes to the uh, something which otherwise requires a certain input, attention, focus, right? So you simply can't afford to do this at, the, at this very phase. You have to find a balance in your life and being able to switch from all the devices at least an hour before you go to sleep, before you rest. And when you go to sleep, you go to sleep in that conscious state. I would even still say you can sit down, cross your legs, and meditate for 15-20 minutes maximum, almost like a prayer, using breathing through the heart, as you have learned. I trust that form of meditation, which doesn't have that vertical, uh, so ham-based, but it is more of that movement which lulls us and all the pranas to settle in the heart as it will inevitably do when all the pranic currents will be withdrawn into the domain of the heart as that what happens during the deep sleep. Already that, as it were, you're inviting all these impressions of the day to be taken back into the heart. All these desires, all these unfulfilled jobs, all these impressions of the day, all these ups and downs, all conversations, all visual and audio input, you invite it all to be reabsorbed, back into the depth void of the heart. This is very important, like nighttime prayer. Not praying in a sense of praying, right? I'm saying that using it as an analogy. It's this meditation on the heart, breathing through the heart. So, other than that, of course, you've been, you've been uh, already, I trust, given a list of things, right? To uh, try to, right? The chamomile, valerian root, the nutmeg, not to be addicted to because nutmeg also is tamasic. And so some pinch of nutmeg, like, I don't know, third or quarter of a teaspoon of powder, fresh nutmeg, into warm milk, cup of warm milk with a lump of uh, ghee, perhaps, and a bit of turmeric. Maybe goat's milk is very nervine, tonic, and very good for vata, very good for nervous system. All that during the winter months, cold months, wearing a woolly or a cotton or a linen or a silken woven hat to keep the water in check. You see? So, I mean, I'm not going to go this because this is really belongs to the therapy of Ayurveda. But I want to just simply uh, give you these reminders which you need to work on further with an Ayurvedic physician to see and to rule out all other potential causes. So that during that very a tender phase, you have support and know what to do. So with regard to how much one should meditate, right? Um, so, okay, that's fine to reduce your meditation and you don't even need to have it one hour per day in one go. Perhaps it might be better if you have it as a short medita shorter meditation, half an hour in the morning with that little rest lying down up to 10 minutes. So the whole practice will take 40 minutes. And then in the evening, you have that breathing through the heart just before going to sleep, already in bed. So when you lay down, you are lulled in. Okay, you lay down and suddenly you feel all these currents. You suddenly feel all this pranic activity. 
Give yourself to that. Don't hold back. Even allow your body to vibrate. Let the kriyas go through. And then gently begin to see how it feels better once you've been laying down on the back. If you turn to the left side, how does it feel? Turn to the right side, how does it feel? Okay? And just still you feel like there is no sleep, it is not coming. Okay, fine. As long as the body is resting. And in no time you will notice how the quality of that deep sleep will still come. Even if there will be a sense as if you are somehow a hovering above it witness. Whereas this is more applicable to um, a dreaming state of consciousness because the witness of the deep sleep experienced more as if submerged underwater. It's a kind of different quality to it. You see, it's like literally as if you are deep down somewhere underwater opening your eyes and nothing is clear, but you feel like in, you're in some kind of uh, ambience of complete submergence. So, I would not recommend you completely quit meditation because I don't think uh, this would be wise either because the, if there are kriyas, if there is propensity for the prana to move, there needs to be time when you give yourself to that. But grounding yourself, barefooted on the grass, and if you work on a computer, as I believe you do, because you, um, I think, produce music, right? You're a musical engineer, you work a lot on the computer. So a lot of static energy. Whatever surfaces you sit on, is it, and what is it, a wooden, your feet are on the wood, or on some PC, some acrylic polyester carpet, right? All this matters now. You've entered the realm of great electricity. So you need to really pay, att pay attention to that and tailor your life to such degree, so that, I mean, to the degree that you can always have this potential for discharge of that static energy. Ipsum bath salts. Uh, diving in rivers, lakes, just to refresh yourself, you know, if you don't live near the sea, and luxury most of us don't have. Um, walking on the grass, just walking outside of your apartment, wherever you live, planting yourself on the ground. All this is very important. Now, particularly as you're going through that phase when you need to ground your vata, whilst at the very same time for the process to continue because you don't want to hold the process. You don't want to um, suppress it somehow, particularly util using some uh, chemicals to do that. This is, this is not at all advisable. Okay? And yes, this, what you address as problems, right? Again, psychologically, I don't want you to um, feel as if I'm not sympathetic to you because I went through this myself and I'm much more sympathetic to you because you have a child, you have a little baby still, two and a half. This is very difficult. I totally understand how it must feel in the family and for you um, personally. But try to make that switch. Don't think of it, let alone speak of it as problem as an issue, as some kind of disturbance, as some kind of pathology. Simply see this as a phase that you are capable of going through with as much integrity, with as much grace, perseverance, and ease, and see how this will begin to pay itself off. Okay?